Hi guys, and welcome to the reading of Act 3, Scene 1 for Macbeth. If you would turn to page 84 of your No Fear Shakespeare books, I'll read out for you a summary that you can copy down into yours. Okay, Banquo suspects that Macbeth obtained the crown through foul play, but is also anticipating his side of the witch's prophecy. Macbeth learns Banquo's plans and orders him to attend that night's banquet. He then orders two murderers to kill Banquo and his son, Fleance. All right, so I'll introduce you to the characters for this scene. This picture will continue to represent Banquo. This picture will represent his son, Fleance. Macbeth is now king, and so he will be represented by this picture. This picture will represent Lady Macbeth. This picture will represent their servant. This will be the first murderer. And this will be the second murderer. This scene opens in Forest Palace, near where the play began in the military camp. Macbeth is going to return from Scone, where he was coronated King of Scotland. Enter Banquo. Thou hast now, King, Cordor, Glamis, all as the weird woman promised, and I fear thou playest most foully for it. Yet it was said it should not stand in the posterity but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. If there comes true from them, as upon thee, Macbeth, their speeches shine. Why, by the verities and thee made good, may they not be my oracles as well, and set me up in hope, but hush no more. Macbeth enters dressed as a king with Lady Macbeth as queen. Lennox, Ross, lords and ladies, as well as other attendants, accompany them. Here's our chief guest. If he had been forgotten, it had been as a gap in our great feast, and all thing unbecoming. Tonight we hold solemn supper, sir, and I'll request your presence. Let your highness command upon me, to the which my duties are with most indissoluble tie forever knit. I do this afternoon. Hey, my good lord. We should have else desired your good advice, which still hath been both grave and prosperous, in this day's council, but will take tomorrow. Is it far you ride? As far, my lord, as will fill up the time twixt this and supper. Go not, my horse, the better. I must become burrower of the night, for a dark hour or twain. Fail not our feast. Lord, I will not. We hear our bloody cousins are bestowed in England and in Ireland, not confessing their cruel parricide, filling their hearers with strange invention. But of that tomorrow, when therewithal we shall have cause of state craving us jointly. Hie to your horse, adieu, till you return at night. Goes Fleance with you. Ay, my lord, our time does call upon us. I wish your horses swift and sure of foot, and so I do commend you to their backs. Farewell. Exit Banquo. Let every man be master of his time, till seven at night, to make society the sweeter welcome. We will keep ourselves till supper time alone, while then God be with you. Exeunt all except for me and a servant. Sirrah, a word with you. Attend those men our pleasure. They are, my lord, without the palace gate. Bring them before us. Exeunt servant. To be thus is nothing, but to be safely thus. Our fears in Banquo stick deep, and in his royalty of nature reigns that which would be feared. Tis much he dares. And to that dauntless temper of his mind, he hath a wisdom that doth guide his valet to act in safety. There is none but he whose being I do fear. And under him my genius is rebuked, as it is said Mark Antony's was by Caesar. He chid the sisters when first they put the name of kin upon me, and bade them speak to him. Then, prophet-like, they hailed him a father to a line of kings. Upon my head they placed a fruitless crown, and put a barren scepter in my grip, thence to be wrenched with an unlineal hand, no son of mine succeeding, if it be so. For Banquo's issue have I filed my mind, 
For them, the gracious Duncan, have I murdered, put rancors in the vessel of my peace. Only for them, and mine eternal jewel, given to the common enemy of man, to make them kings, the seed of Banquo kings. Rather than so, come fate into the list, and champion me to the utterance. Who's there? Enter the servant, murderer one, and murderer two. Is it not yesterday we spoke together? It was, so please, your highness. Well then, now have you considered of my speeches? Know that it was he, in the times past, which held you so under fortune, which you thought had been our innocent self. This I made good to you in our last conference, passed in probation with you. How you were born in hand, how crossed the instruments who were wrought with them, and all things else that might to half a soul and to a notion crazed say, thus did Banquo. You made it known to us. I did so, and went further, which is now our point of second meeting. Do you find your patience so predominant in your nature that you can let this go? Are you so gospeled to pray for this good man and for his issue, whose heavy hand hath bowed you to the grave and beggared yours for ever? We are men, my liege. I, in the catalogue ye go for men, as hounds and greyhounds, mongrels, spaniels, curs, shawls, water rugs, and demi wolves, are clept all by the name of dogs. The valued file distinguishes the swift, the slow, the subtle, the housekeeper, the hunter, every one according to the gift which bounteous nature hath in him closed, whereby he does receive particular addition from the bill that writes them all alike, and so of men. Now, if you have a station in the file, not in the worst rank of manhood, Say it, and I will put that business in your bosoms, whose execution takes your enemy off, grapples you to the heart and love of us, who wear our health but sickly in this life, which in his death were perfect. I am one, my liege, whom the vile blows and buffets of the world have so incensed that I am reckless, what I do in spite the world. And I another, so weary with disasters, tugged with fortune, that I would set my life on any chance to mend it or be rid of it. Both of you know Banquo was your enemy. True, my lord. So is he mine, and in such bloody distance that every minute of his being thrusts against my nearest of life, and though I could with barefaced power sweep him from my sight, and bid my will avouch it, yet I must not. For certain friends that are both his and mine, whose loves I may not drop, but wail his fall, who I myself struck down, and thence it is that I to your assistance do make love, masking the business from the common eye, for sundry weighty reasons. We shall, my lord. Perform what you command us. Though our lives, your spirit shine through you. With this hour at most, I will advise you where to plant yourselves, acquaint you with the perfect of spy of the time, the moment on it, for it must be done tonight, and something from the palace, always thought that I require a clearness, and with him, to leave no rubs nor botches in the work, Fleance his son, that keeps him company, whose absence is no less material to me than his father's, must embrace the fate of that dark hour. Resolve yourselves apart, I'll come to you anon. We are resolved, my lord. I'll call upon you straight, abide within. Exunt the two murderers. It is concluded. Banquo, thy soul's flight. If it find heaven, must find it out tonight. 
Okay, so that ends Act 3, Scene 1, and now I'm going to run down through the vocabulary and reference to themes that I think are important for both your booklet work as well as future essay writing. So we're going to return to page 84, and I'm going to start on line 2. And we're going to look at the phrase, as the weird women promised. And this is a quote that you may record in the front of your booklet because it's referring to the witch's prophecy and the role it's playing in these subsequent murders. So um, what Banquo is saying is that he thinks that the prophecy that the witches gave Macbeth has been fulfilled by force. He says, I fear they playeth playedest most foully for it. So that means that a murder has happened and that's what's led Macbeth to be king. If we go down now to line seven, he says their speeches shine, which means that the things that the weird sisters have said have turned out to be true and they've shown favour to Macbeth. When it says that the Senate sounded on line, well, between that lines 10 and 11 in the stage directions, this is referring to a royal trumpet call. And if you remember when I was reading out the people who entered, I played a trumpet sound and that would have been similar to what they would have heard. We'll continue going down. Um, lines 14, Lady Macbeth says, and all thing unbecoming. Here the phrase all dash thing means everything and underneath that on line 14 Macbeth refers to a solemn supper which is another word for a state banquet. So solemn here just meaning something that is serious or to be taken seriously as opposed to something very sad. Banquo then uses the word indissoluble on line 18 and that means that which cannot be broken. So Banquo, despite um, being suspicious of Macbeth at this point and believing that he had a hand to play in Duncan's murder to become king, says to Macbeth's face, are with most indissoluble tie forever knit. So showing that he has a bit of true-facedness there, that he has a strong duty to Macbeth. We'll turn now to page 86. And we'll skip down to lines 27, where Banquo says, I must become a borrower of the night for a dark hour or twain. And this phrase means, I will have to make use of one or two hours of darkness to complete my ride. And this is going to be important in the following scene when he is killed, because again, we're going to see this theme, this image, firstly, this imagery of darkness, but then the theme of reality being covered up. So if you remember to earlier acts, we've seen both Macbeth call on the darkness to cover up what he was going to do. He used the phrase, stars hide your fires and let not something see my black and deep desires. I can't remember what he says in between those two lines. And we also see Lady Macbeth say, come dark night and she talks about the fire or the smoke of hell covering up her great deeds her murderous deeds and so we see Banquo saying that the last hours of his ride are going to be in darkness and we know from the events that follow this that it will be in that darkness that he is murdered just like Duncan was murdered in the dark we'll continue down with Macbeth on line 30, he starts explaining something about our bloody cousins. So this is in reference now to the fact that both he and Banquo are cousins to Malcolm and Donald Bain, Duncan's two sons. So they're both in line to the throne and they both have a claim to it. But Macbeth perhaps is older or has a higher title, having been both Thane of Glamis and Cawdor. And so he was the one crowned king when the two sons fled. And he mentions that one is in England and one is in Ireland, just like they planned. So they um, ha luckily escaped. And then he says, not confessing their cruel parasite. So parasite is a word. If you do legal, you might know this. That's referring to the killing of a father. 
I think it refers to the killing of a parent in general, though para I think is coming from the word patriarch, but I've heard of the phrase double parricide being referred to the killing of both parents. And then he says that they're filling their hearers with a strange invention. And strange invention here means lies. So this is referring to the start of Macbeth's downfall. So the two sons, Malcolm and Donald Bain, the true heirs to the throne, have escaped. They've escaped to England and Ireland. And they're filling up people's minds with what Macbeth calls lies, but are most likely the true events that he has murdered Duncan. And then he says adieu, which is French to, for goodbye on line 35. And then he checks, goes Fleance with you. So Fleance, remember, is Banquo's son. We'll keep going once Banquo exits. Um, Macbeth is talking now. And he says, let every man be master of his time till seven at night. So he's talking to the whole crowd. And he says, go be in charge of your time until 7 p.m to make society the sweeter welcome, which means to make having company all the better. So just spend time by yourself. And this might have a double meaning where he's hoping that he can prevent the rumors of his murder, murderous actions spreading too quickly. So he's telling people to isolate and stay apart. So now let's go to page 88, when everyone has left except for Macbeth and the servant, and he talks to the servant, he calls him Sirrah which is um, an old-fashioned, less formal way to say sir. And then he says, attend those men, which means go and get those men. And at this point, you might have been able to see off stage the two murderers waiting. And then the servant says they're just outside the palace gate. So without the palace gate, without means just outside. And then Macbeth says, bring them before us. And it's when the servant e enters on this page, page 88, that Macbeth gives a big speech. And this is his justification for why he has to murder Banquo. And it's full of historical references, which might not at first be easy to pick up on. So he says, to be thus is nothing. So to be this is nothing, he's saying, meaning to be king is nothing unless he can be king safely, but to be safely thus. And he's saying he's afraid of Banco more than anyone else. And we explain, and then he explains why. He says he has a dauntless temper, which is a fearless quality of his mind. And then it says on lines 56, my genius is rebuked, which genius here is um, the old Roman, it might be Greek word for genius, which was referring to a guardian spirit. So his spirit, his guardian spirit is rebuked, which means to be made fun of or challenged or spoken down. As it is said, Mark Antony's was by Caesar. Now the reference here, the historical reference to Caesar is not to Julius Caesar, but to his nephew, Octavius Caesar. And he was defeated by Antony, so it says, as Mark Antony's was by Caesar, and that, who then established the Roman Empire. Uh, and then straight after this, it says he chid the sisters, which means that Banquo made fun of the Caesar, uh, the witches, when uh, they called Macbeth king. But then he asked them, as we know from Act one, he asked them to give him a prophecy. And if you remember, the witch's prophecy to Banquo was that he would father a line of kings. And that is what's playing on Macbeth's mind here. So he says on line 60, and that is the crux of this whole speech, they hailed him father to a line of kings. And it would be good to highlight that line, line 60, and it would be a good one to record if you were ever to analyze Macbeth's motivations for his murders, particularly his attempted murder of Fleance and his murder of Banquo. They hailed him father to a line of kings. And then he uses imagery. He says, upon my head, they placed a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my grip. So a scepter is a type of staff that a king would be given. And of course we know what a crown is, but it's the adjectives that provide the imagery here fruitless and 
barren. So fruitless is referring is used in real life when it's not being used metaphorically to talk to a tr about usually a plant or a tree that was unable to bear fruits or a harvest usually that wasn't providing a crop or food that could be eaten. So those things would be called fruitless, literally without fruit. And barren means it's something that's empty, like a desert, a barren desert. But they're also used to talk about fertility and impotence. So here the imagery is referring to Macbeth being unable to have children. So Macbeth is assuming that he will have no sons and therefore the, the count crown will pass to Banquo and his son Fleance. And he uses the word, it will be thence wrenched with an unlineal hand. So the hand meaning not from his family's line. So the power will be wrenched from him. And if we continue down, he then says that this will basically make his acts, his murderous acts, useless. So if we look at line 68, he says, well, let's start on 67. For them, the gracious Duncan have I murdered. So I'm not 100% sure there if he means his own children, his future potential children, or the witches, but he says, for them, I murdered Duncan. Or, no, sorry, I've just looked at the English side. So what he means there, he's almost speaking bitterly and sarcastically, saying, so what, I killed Duncan for Banquo's sons, for them I killed Duncan? Put rankle, rankers in the vessel of my peace. Now that's a line that you would want to highlight because it's a symbol of his growing madness. So he's put rankers in the vessel of his peace. So rankers meaning bitterness into his sort of soul, his peaceful soul, he's included bitterness, showing that he's very troubled after the murder that he committed. And then he says, only for them, again referring to Banquo's sons, and mine eternal jewel, so them and my eternal soul, given to the common enemy of man. So basically saying, I will give him over to hell, the common enemy of man being the devil. So I've written a short summary here just to understand the sentiment. So here Macbeth expresses his bitterness over the fact he condemned his soul to hell and killed Duncan only to have a fruitless crown as in no heir as all his work would only benefit Banquo's line. Okay, so let's go across now to page 90 and we'll go down to line 81. We'll start actually on line 80. And Macbeth speaking again here after the murderers have said a few things. And he says, past in probation, which is referring to the fact that he's already met with these murderers before and he's handed it over some kind of fabricated evidence to show that Banquo has been making their lives hell. So I've got an assumption here. We know the 11th century, we know that Scotland was under a feudal system. So these murderers were perhaps men living on either Macbeth's or Banquo's land and their lives had been held before this. So perhaps if they were in the region in which Macbeth was Thane over them when he was Thane of Glamis, maybe he was taxing them or forcing them to work extremely hard and that maybe made these murderous men hate him. But he's gotten them aside and he's given them some kind of evidence to show that it was Banquo's greed and not his own that was were putting them through this kind of existence. So maybe he was saying, oh, Banquo made me work you extra hard so he could get this extra grain or something like that. So basically, he's drummed up hatred for them toward Banquo. And then he says, how you were born in the hand. So born in the hand means deceived. So he's made it seem like Banquo's convinced these men that Macbeth was the one who was driving them so hard to work, making them lives hell in whatever way he has. And then underneath that, he says, who wrought with them. So wrought with meaning the used. And then underneath that, to half a soul, a notion crazed. A notion there means mind. To half a soul, to a mind craze. Say, thus did Banquo. So basically, at this point, Macbeth has lost any uncertainty of pursuing his bloodthirsty ambitions. He's not needing anyone to manipulate them. him. He has not re-met with the witches at this point. 
And he is keeping all of this from Lady Macbeth. So no one's manipulating him to kill Blanco. He's doing it all on his own. And that's made very clear in the following scenes. Then Macbeth starts talking about dogs. So we'll go down to line 92. And he says, I, in the catalogue, ye go for men. So he's talking about a metaphorical catalogue. So we think of a catalogue or a book with a list of things. He's saying, in this metaphorical book, you're classified as men. So you are men. But if we think about dogs, there's lots of different types of dogs. And he lists very different breeds. So from Greyhounds, mongrels, spaniels, curs, so on and so forth. And he's basically, you're a kind of man, but there are different kinds of men. And he's questioning what kind of men they are. Just like in previous acts, Lady Macbeth questioned what kind of man Macbeth was, or indeed whether he even was a man. So basically, he's manipulating them to commit murder just like she did. And we'll skip across to page 92, and he says, partially addition, so addition means distinction, from the bill that writes them all alike. So here's a chance to distinguish yourselves, he's saying. As so of men, now if you have a station in the file, so if you have a position in the rankings of men, this is, you are the worst rank of manhood, he says. Uh, or not in the worst rank of manhood. So you've got an opportunity to get out of the worst rank of manhood. And he says, say it and I will put that business in your bosom. So I'll give you that opportunity. I'll put that business, that job into your heart and set you out to do it so that you can become a better kind of man. So this is a two-pronged strategy. And that's a phrase that you could use in an essay talking about Macbeth's ambition. He's using a two pronged strategy in order to achieve an evil purpose. So on the one hand, he's lied to them to make them hate Banquo, but knowing that that alone is not enough, that you can still overcome that hatred, he refers to the gospel. So perhaps through their spirituality, through praying and Christianity, they could overcome that hatred. But then he questions their manhood and, and inverts and turns what's good to what's bad and what's bad to what's good, just like the witch has predicted, foul and fair and fair is foul. And he makes it seem like it's a good thing to commit murder. It makes him better men. It makes him more of men, in which, uh, which we know, in fact, is the opposite. If you commit murder, that makes you a lesser person. But that's his manipulation strategy. We'll keep going down when the first murderer is talking on lines 113, and he says, so wary with disasters, tugged with fortune. So tugged there means scuffled. So he's referring to the bad luck. He's had a scuffle or a fight with fortune. He hasn't had much of it in his life. So he's agreeing he's had a bad life. And then Macbeth reminds them, you know, Banquo was your enemy on line 115, and they agree. And then we'll go down to lines... 117 onward when Beth's speaking again. He says that every minute of his being thrust against my near, nearest of life. So he's saying every moment Banquo is alive thrust against my heart. So nearest of life is referring to heart there. And then he says and my bid, bid will avouch it. So he's saying that uh, his bid, his job that he's given them to so murder Banquo is justified but he's saying it must be kept secret he's saying that he needs to be kept clear of suspicion because they have common friends so they say for certain friends that are both his and mine so friends that we both have will wail his fall which means lament his or cry for his death so they can't know that Macbeth killed him because then he would lose their loyalty and then we'll go to the last page, page 94. The murderers agree that they will do it. And Macbeth interrupts the second murderer who says, they are lives, and then he interrupts. And he tells them a, a weird phrase in line 130, acquaint you with the perfect spy of the time, which means basically find out the most up-to-date information. He makes it very clear, he says, I require a clearness, which means I need to be kept clear of suspicion. He says, leave no rubs, 
Rubs here is an old term. It means impediments, and it's usually a term for bowling. So if you were impeded when bowling, you would have rubs. Um, and then on line 136, he says, who keeps it, he's talking about fleance now, that his absent is no less material. Material means important to me. So, of course, it's important the murderers kill fiance as well because they need to wipe out Banquo's entire line to make sure that Banquo can't take over the throne. And then he says, resolve yourselves apart. So he basically says, take some private time to think about whether you want to commit this murder and be sure of it. And then the both murderers say, we are resolved, my lord, which shows that they have already decided to commit this murder. And that is it for Act 3, Scene 1.